become a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash golden era bookworm for hard to find books scans of rare photos and articles on the golden era of bodybuilding hi everybody golden era bookworm here today i have the pleasure of bringing you my first interview with john john park where he describes in great detail the biography of his father the following interview covers the early years of reg park's bodybuilding career I had initially saved the voice recording and video footage, however, the files could not be synchronized and even though I tried the whole week, I couldn't do it correctly. Therefore, I have chosen to present the interview as a podcast and instead have painstakingly inserted many photographs from my collection as well as from the internet, which help visualize what John John Park says about his father. I truly hope that you enjoy this special presentation and to John John Park I thank you sincerely for the opportunity to share your father's biography enjoy again uh, thanks for the uh, time John John uh, and uh, I know you finished your little power drink now but um, uh, again we can start with uh, Reg's early um, uh, training his early years how he got into bodybuilding and I guess, um, yeah, what was his uh, earliest training methods like, if you can start with that? Sure. So, um, so Reg, Reg was, a, uh, when he was at school, he was a very good national athlete um, and uh, he excelled in um, uh, football as we know, soccer as they call it in the States, and played for his school team and also played for uh, the Leeds United reserves team at the age of 16. In those days, Leeds uh, were a top team in, in the UK and certainly in the late 60s and early 70s, they were one of the top teams in Europe. And his goal was always to be a uh, professional footballer. Um, Whilst at school, he captained the uh, Yorkshire, which would be the equivalent of the state, the province he lived in, the Yorkshire Schoolboys uh, football team. And uh, he had gotten injured, and he was sent to do some uh, rehab work, uh, rudimentary rehab work for, for his knee, uh, which in those days consisted of the old iron boot uh, leg extensions, yeah. which... Uh, for any uh, knowledgeable therapist today, they wouldn't do that movement at all. <laughs> that strap does old iron boots on where you put a, a bar with the weight plates on the side underneath the iron boots and the leg extensions. Yeah. Um, around the age of 16, he met a young uh, man who was already in his 20s, so several years older than him, uh, during the summer at the local swimming baths in uh, swimming pool in, in Leeds, uh, the roundy swimming, swimming, swimming baths, and the guy had a good physique, a guy by the name of David Cohen. So Reg went up to him and he, he, he said to him, uh, what do you do uh, to develop your build? And he said, I do weight training. And he invited my dad along to join him, mm -hmm. which he did. And uh, he had this rudimentary gym in the back of his home, his father worked from home. He was a he was a tailor, and uh, he had this you know free weight predominantly um, um, all over the floor. My dad started training with him, and frankly found it quite boring. He worked out there for at least three weeks, and uh, what kept him going was uh, in the UK, uh, especially in those days, they would have around three o'clock in the afternoon on high tea, mm -hmm. which wasn't just regular tea as, as, as we know it, but it was a tea that was tea and sandwiches and cakes and pastries yeah. and cookies. The works. And she was such, <laughs> what the work? She was such a good cook and bake and that, that's what kept my dad coming. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how long the relationship lasted between the two of them, um, but I do know that um, 
uh, Reg went into the uh, military, mm -hmm. and um, when he came out, he was there for 18 months. It was just after the Second World War, and he was in um, in Malaysia at the time. And being that it was uh, tropical weather in the summer, walking around for the most part without shirts on all, all day, mm -hmm. uh, one of the corporals noticed that he had pretty well developed physique. And he asked him if he'd like to be a PE master uh, for all the troops and the refugees. And he said, sure. And because of this, he had the opportunity to have pretty much carte blanche to the uh, military base's kitchen. Oh, great. So <laughs> he made sure that he was well nourished the whole time. Yeah. So he was in great shape. And um, he came out of the military. And at that time, they had the uh, Commonwealth Games, which was being held in London. And um, he went to watch it. And in conjunction with that, they had the first ever uh, Mr. Universe competition. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was no such thing as amateur and professional in those days. It was one category. That was in 1949, and right? This was in 1949. Yeah. Uh, normally held around the end of the year, like October period. Yeah. He had, uh, prior to that, entered some competitions, uh, I think photographic competitions where you'd send your pictures into magazines. But I know he entered a competition uh, and he came in fourth. Yeah, 1946, then, Mr. Britain. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, or I think maybe Mr. North East Britain. Something yeah. like that, yeah. Yeah, and then I think he won a Mr. North East Britain, and then in 1949, uh, he had won a Mr. Britain contest. Yeah. Um, and then he went to watch this contest, and he was so mesmerized by Reeves and Grimmick. Um, and Reeves, I would say, probably had a more... Uh, aesthetic physique. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, uh, whereas Grimmick had this more muscular Herculean physique. Yeah, powerful. Both had great physique. Yeah. And they both had symmetry for their, their types of physiques. Yeah. Which was interesting. Back in those days and even into the, I want to say, uh, late 70s, early 80s, you could tell the different physiques unlike yeah. today. Yeah, exactly. You could see silhouettes you could see silhouettes of the different physiques mm -hmm. and you knew exactly who they were. Yeah. Today you wouldn't be able to tell the difference for yeah. the most part. There's a character um, to each physique. Exactly. Yeah. So Grimmick, being a superb athlete who was also on the US Olympic lifting team in the past, um, his posing was was very was was uh, fantastic and apparently at the end of his routine, he, he landed on the floor and did a double bicep pose with his full splits. Correct, yeah. And my dad was so uh, intrigued by this and he said, made up his mind and he said to people around him that he was going to win the Mr. Universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and sure enough, uh, he entered the following year, 1950. Grimmick then retired and... Um, I remember apparently Grimmick was a judge at the uh, Mr. Uh, the, the, uh, the Mr. Britain. Yes, correct. Uh, in 49, which my dad had won, and, he, and there was one of my dad's competitors who was also pretty well known in the UK called John Lees. Right, right. And yes. he, he made a comment. He said, John Lees is a big boy. And then he saw my dad. He says, but Rich Park's a big man. <laughs> exactly. <And laughs> The night before the 1950 Mr. Universe contest, if I'm correct, they also had the Mr. Europe, mm -hmm. uh, which was on the Friday evening. Mm -hmm. And Reg won the Mr. Europe competition yeah. in 1950. And the following night, he competed against Reeves yeah. in the Mr. Universe competition. And he came second. Mm -hmm. Now, I know I might be biased, but I read a lot of responses uh, over the years on the internet and 
on Instagram and a lot of different people. But frankly, in the lineup where they're standing next to each other, I think Reg was superior to Reeves. Yeah, I know the photo uh, you're talking about. They're just standing relaxed. Yeah. And you can see uh, the difference in muscularity. Yeah. And I actually saw just recently, first time I saw a different shot from a different angle, more of a side angle. Yeah. Which yeah. I hadn't seen. And in fact, one of the comments was from uh, one of the guys on Instagram. I don't know. He said in his book, uh, Park, Park, or Edge Reeves. Yeah. Uh, Reeves was his last ever competition. Correct. And he was a, a very handsome guy. He was, he was a big name. Uh, but if you look at those pictures, Reg, Reg was much sharper in his abdominal area, mm -hmm. the serratus, the intercostals. His pecs were firmer. His deltoid cap stood out more. So there was only one point differential between the two of them. Yeah. But I think, you know, Reeves probably got it because of who he was and it was his name. Uh, but it didn't deter Reg. And shortly after that, um, there was a knock on his door. And it was uh, Joe Weeder uh, who had uh, come down, to, I guess, taken a train down from uh, London to Leeds uh, unexpectedly and uh, came in and offered my dad a contract because mm -hmm. he had already had the magazines then. And um, he, got, he got pretty ill while he was there. So my uh, late grandmother, he ended up staying there, nursed him back to health. Yeah, so I've heard. And he, he invited my dad to the States and they, um, he came to the States and he worked for him in uh, New Jersey where his offices used to be, where they used to publish the magazines and um, had the different booklets and the supplements and he had, you know, all the guys at the time, he would promote and they would promote his supplements, etc. He had guys like uh, Leroy Colbert and uh, Marvin Etta. Whoever, whoever was probably known at the time. Yeah. I don't recall them all. Uh, but they also held the um, the uh, 19... Uh, this would have been in 1951. They had the, uh, America's Best Developed Man because he had spent some time there. Apparently he was eligible to compete and he won America's wasn't best developed man, it was best developed athlete. Yes, correct. But he, he spent time traveling around the States, training with various guys. He trained in uh, Abe Goldberg's gym in New York and mm. uh, uh, with the late uh, Sig Klein's gym in New York. And he trained with a guy for a while who was incredibly strong, known for his strength, not a very big guy, not a very tall guy by the name of Marvin Eder. Marvin Eder. Who was doing... Yeah dips and pull-ups with the likes of 300 plus, plus pounds. Correct. They spent time, he went to Florida, he trained in Florida for a while. Uh, he came to California, he spent time training in California. Um, he trained at the Muscle Beach. He, um, he went up to San Francisco, he actually visited Steve Reeves. Oh wow, didn't know uh, that. He, who he competed against at Ed Yarrick's gym in San Francisco. Right, right. We competed the year before. And he went to Hawaii, he spent some time. There were some fantastic shots of him taken in Hawaii, by the way. And he met and trained with uh, uh, a guy by the name of Timmy Leon, yep. who was a former Olympic uh, uh, US uh, lifter, mm -hmm. but also had a good physique and yeah. competed as well. So he, he spent a good six months here in the States and I think really refined and polished his training and his physique. Yeah. Um, and he, he then went back to the UK uh, and I think that's when he was really uh, using the 5 by 5 principle a lot, mm -hmm. which I, my research apparently was more... In, in the, in somebody in the 40s mm -hmm. had, had uh, written about it, but it wasn't very well known, and he certainly refined it and popularized it, and that became the mainstay of his training, working with full body, yeah. you know, three days a week. So that would have been in the early 50s? 
<coughs> early 50s. And it's interesting how popular it's become today. Yes. Again, it's, it's, it's revived. Yeah. In fact, shortly before he passed, there was a whole article about it. Um, in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was Newsweek magazine about okay. uh, you know, his five by five training principle. And, uh, you know, he trained with some really strong guys. One of the guys uh, was a guy who uh, was an old friend of Joe Gold's, and I met him when I first came here. Yeah, he used to open up uh, Joe Gold's. On Main Street in Santa Monica, and then his second location early in the morning. He trained early. Big man, good 275, a good 6263. But he was doing incline presses with in those days, well over 300 pounds, you know. Mm. Uh, for three, and he's four, 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 very strong. His name was St and, Steve uh, Steve Majanian. Majanian. I have to uh, look him up. Uh, an Armenian guy, Armenian very guy. powerful guy, and so Richard, you know, met these guys and worked out with the likes of these guys. And uh, uh, I wouldn't remember all their names. I'd have to do some serious research. Um, and then, of course, he went back and in '51, you know, he won the he, he won. Yeah. When he came out of the military, uh, he was training in his backyard, um, which. Uh, which was a, a bench with a barbell and loose plates uh, and uh, a pulley system that he attached to the roof of his house with a rope uh, and a bar so they could do back work. And he used to cover it with tarpaulin. But he would train every day, rain, snow, sleet, sunshine, which was very rare in those days, especially in the north of England, bitter cold. Uh, we're wearing three pairs of socks, military boots, and three sweatsuits, and he trained up to three hours a day. That's crazy. And uh, I know that before he won the Mister uh, Britain in '49, he um, had been he had just finished a business course, and uh, he hadn't trained for. A while and his nutrition one it wasn't as great because he's just you know devoting all his time to studying for this business course yeah so he had three weeks to get himself in in shape really and up to par and uh he developed this philosophy which he liked to tell me about about conserving energy uh which became like his mainstay is to not run if you could stand, to not, um, if you could walk rather, to not walk if you could stand, to not stand if you could sit, and to not sit if you could lie down. So it was all about energy conservation. So he did this for three weeks, ate massive amounts of calories, didn't go anywhere, and he even said that if they used to go to the movies, like if he'd go with his friends, he'd make them drop him off outside the theater while they went to look for parking so he wouldn't waste extra <laughs> burn extra calories walking from the car to the theater and back. And then when they finished the movies, it would make them get the car and pick him up and then drop him off at home. That's the uh, and, Reg uh, Park anabolic program. <laughs> the National anabolic program. <laughs> and we put him on 25 pounds in a three-week period using massive amounts of poundages drinking plenty of raw, non-pasteurized milk in those days. Yeah, that was his protein so, source. Uh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And, uh, of course, my grandmother would spend a lot of time in the kitchen cooking and preparing his food. <laughs> of course. So from the, from the outdoor gym, progressed uh, to training in a corrugated iron gym which they rented with no running water with no electricity with no mirrors uh, with holes in the ceiling that the snow and the sleet and the rain would leak through and there was a, a tap outside which they would walk to and fill a bucket with water and that was their drinking water while they worked there. <coughs> so that was his um, second gym that he um uh, he uh, progressed to. Was that at his home? Time. That wasn't at his home. That no, was. No, it was a, a, in fact, he even walked me by there 
years later when we visited. Right. When I was a kid, probably about 12. And he said that was the garage that he used to rent. Right. So they, people they put, rented it. People didn't have garages at home, so they would rent these garages. And I get it. Park their cars there. Yeah. And what? Because there's no ways. In those days, you could leave your car sitting outside uh, and start it the next morning. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned that he trained with David Cohen, but um, I haven't actually found much about him. Um, and how many months would you say that he actually trained with with David Cohen first before before he even then started training at home, which you mentioned? You know, I can't give you a time period because this was before he went into the military. And right. This was when he was still in high school, when he was like sixteen. I'm not sure exactly how long it lasted. Um, and I'm not sure if David Cohen even was a competitive bodybuilder. I just think he, you know, training for himself. Right. Okay. But I know he had quite an influence, being that he was a physique that my dad was impressed by, because even from a young age, he was impressed by athletic physiques, physical, you know, physical guys. And uh, he was very close to my late great grandfather, and he had spent some time with them. Uh, because, you know, this was, you have to understand, during the war. And people from the big cities were sent into the rural areas where my late great grandfather lived. Mm-hmm. And because, um, especially the young kids, they, they, you know, there was always the threat of danger of being bombed. So they sent him into these rural areas. And he spent time with my late great grandfather, who was very close to, and apparently, on the wall of the house, there were two drawings of these uh, Greek uh, warriors wearing all the garb. But they had, you know, they showed them with, you know, with the physique showing. And Regis were always very impressed with that. He always was impressed with those athletic, muscular-looking physiques. So I think that, you know, from a very young age, that's kind of what influenced him. Then he saw it in real life on this guy David Cohen. Yeah. It's something yeah. else. Seeing something in real yeah. life is something else. <clears throat> yeah. So so then, you know, then he came back and uh, he won the 51 universe. Um, his uh, relationship with Joe Wiener, unfortunately, or with the Wiener brothers, didn't last very long. Okay. Uh, because they signed a contract and uh, he's... He said that uh, Joe Wiener said he would take care of something, which apparently he never did. Okay. And my late grandfather, my dad's father, got very upset. And, uh, you know, they had a falling out, uh, which I have to say, <clears throat> later on, Joe Wiener was very fond of my dad. And uh, whenever my mom and dad came over here, you know, when I came to live, they would get together, and um, there was no animosity or ill feeling. But um, I remember my dad saying that uh, because you know what 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 Joe Weider used to do that he was a fantastic marketing guy. Yeah, he was always a great marketer. He was a genius at marketing. Yeah, he certainly was, and he'd say the Weider training principles, mm-hmm. and kind of make claim, which the guys went along with, I guess they've been paid, to every guy he had that we, his training principles, which really wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. And then me, I remember my dad saying in his biography that uh, we that took responsibility for uh, for Reg Park. He said he sired Reg Park, and, and, and my dad was pretty adamant. He said, no, he never sired me. My father sired, you know. But um, he certainly helped uh, publicize Reg, mm-hmm. you know, um, which he did with all his magazines. But uh, they, they, they went their separate ways. And, of course, my dad never became, other than his first six months or so, uh, uh, and when he won the universe in 51 up until that time, because we didn't have any competitions in those days. The IFBB didn't have any competition. It was all in NABA, NABA in those days. And I think shortly after he won the 51 Universe, their uh, their relationship split. And then, of course, 
Reg and his father started their own magazine, the Reg Park Journal, which you know all about. And yeah. had the predecessors to those magazines. Um, I've got one here. Nice That's right, Mr. Universe. That's right. the very That's first famous, one. <laughs> That's a famous shot, actually. <laughs> um, and, you know, I told you I was going to go through my collection and send you any duplicates I have, which I still have to do. <laughs> um, but, um, so they, you know, started their own magazine and then, of course, selling equipment, uh, equipment and, and, and training programs, mm -hmm. of which you all have, you know, the strength and bulk training program, which was <coughs> the famous 5x5, five five, which he popularized. Yes, correct. Big arm, big, big chest, etc. Uh, and developed and, and, and gym clothing, you know. The Reg Park t shirts, V necks, uh, which are still in vogue today as I'm wearing one. <laughs> uh, not a Reg Park, but. Uh, and uh, so winning the 51 universe really put, put his business on the map. Hmm. And uh, I can tell you from the stories I know that he was using a lot of poundages in those days. Yeah. It was all about poundage. And, and, Working full body workouts up to three, you know, uh, full full body three yeah. days a week. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, in 1958, he had been to South Africa. He was taken to South Africa by a group called the African Consolidated Theatres, <coughs> which uh, uh, were a, a group that ran the... Uh, the movie houses, the theatres in South Africa, and my dad would guest pose uh, during uh, intermission in those days in the movies. Right. So on Saturdays, there would be, you know, uh, three shows. There would be the matinee, the early show, and the evening show. And um, whilst he was there, he was staying in a hotel downtown Johannesburg. And in the hotel was a, a jewelry store. It was pretty well known in those days called Ike Schwartz Jewelers, who's uh, my late uncle, uh, was my mother's mother's brother. But he was a massive uh, sports fan. And uh, he invi invited my dad to come to his home. Um, and uh, to meet people and he had a, a what we call in South Africa snooker as they know here pool table right right yeah. and he was playing he was playing pool and um, he wanted to introduce my dad and make him feel comfortable in South Africa he had some various people around and my recently late uncle Johnny Isaacs mm -hmm. uh, started bodybuilding, I uh, wanted to meet my dad, and he asked my mother if uh, she would like to meet Mr. Universe, and of course she really had no interest or care at all, but he <laughs> dragged her along, and uh, she was a professional ballet dancer, and when she arrived, she was in her ballet outfit, uh, no makeup, you know, but just very natural, and if I say myself, so, say so myself just from the pictures I see stunningly beautiful and my dad took one look at her and he said to my uncle may I use your phone please and he said sure and he had apparently had a date that evening with a, a local top model but he called her to cancel the date he hadn't even said a word to my mother he just took one look at her <laughs> and he asked, my, he asked my mother if she would join him for lunch she was, I think, 18 or 19 at the time. She was a little shy. And, you know, we're talking like early 50s. Mm -hmm. And he, she, she said to him, um, he said to her, would you like, would you join me for lunch? And she said, yes, would you, would you mind if I brought my mother along? So he said, no, not at all. So they went for lunch. And uh, there's a famous shot of them walking down the, the street in the city of Johannesburg. And, you know, my mother and her mother were very well dressed. One was on each side of them with their arms wrapped around each other and he was wearing his 
British blazer with the Union Jack on it. Um, and they went for lunch, and he had never had uh, borscht, as we know, as beetroot soup. Right, right. And he ended up their first ever date having, he liked it so much, he had seven plates of borscht, seven <laughs> bowls of borscht. Such <laughs> was his hunger, my God. <laughs> talk, talk about making an impression on a young girl on your first date. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Anyway. He, he went back to South Africa and, I mean, back to the UK and um, I think competed in the universe. And during that time, my uh, mother uh, was uh, invited out by my uncle to uh, uh, go out one Saturday evening and she really didn't want to go. She had met my dad. And, she wasn't interested in anybody else, and they were corresponding on a regular basis. And his intent was to go back to South Africa. And they had a terrible car accident. The truck driver went into them. And in the process, she was pretty badly injured, severed all the tendons in her ankle. Oh, damn. And they were even talking, talking about, which they fortunately didn't, amputating her foot. But that was the end of her dancing career. And... Um, of course, my dad came out shortly thereafter. He tells a funny story how staying at my parents, my, my late grandparents' place, there was a, an enclosed patio in those days in the apartment, and he was staying in that, in, that, in the, uh, I guess, a spare room, but it was really a patio that was enclosed. And apparently, my mom was pretty popular because she was a, a good looking woman. And these guys used to arrive at the door with bouquets of flowers and chocolates, etc., because she was recovering from this accident. And he would answer the door. And he'd take the flowers and the chocolates and say, thank you very much, and close the door. <laughs> <laughs> and take them in. And he apparently ending up eating all the, all the chocolates. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, when he was in South Africa, say, in 58, <laughs> I was... I was born in, uh, uh, the, yeah, so this was like in the, after he had won the universe in 51. I'm getting my dates a little bit mixed up because I was born in 57. My sister would have been born in 55. So he went to live in South Africa after the 51 universe. And whilst he was in South Africa, uh, he got involved in the gym business. And my late uh, maternal grandfather on my mom's side, Joe, uh, suggested to my dad that he should consider going to compete in the Mr. Universe again mm -hmm. to uh, help promote the business. He felt it really, obviously, for the intent of winning it, put the gym business on the, uh, on the map. But he had taken his mail order business from the UK to South Africa, so he was running it out of the UK now and South Africa, the same thing. So, of course, he did enter in 58, and uh, <coughs> he ended up winning it, and it really helped take his gym and mail order business to the next level. It really created a platform for him. Yeah. So, um, there was no intention of him he had no intention of competing in the Miss Universe again, even after 51. You know, he could tell how he stood on the DS after he received his award and he looked around and he felt it was a little anticlimactic to the extent of he enjoyed the training for it more than he did the actual winning of the competition. He wasn't planning on entering again. My grandfather convinced him to go and, which was a good thing and compete again um, and that really helped and then the same thing happened in 65 whereby he was uh, filming the Hercules movies in, uh, in, in Chinachita in Rome mm -hmm. the famous Chinachita meaning Cinema City where they used to film all the sword and sandals movies the gladiator movies Spartacus yeah. Uh, the Spaghetti Westerns. Spaghetti Westerns. <laughs> and he was invited to uh, do 
do a film test for Hercules. So I was apparently very young, so this was, you know, uh, I guess late 50s, very early 60s, early 60s. I couldn't have been more than two at the time, two, three, maybe. And uh, we were on the beach in Cape Town on vacation, and somebody walked down to the beach with a telegram, which was from China Cheetah, inviting my dad to go to Rome and do a film test. They said if he's willing to come, there would be tickets waiting at the Alitalia desk at the airport. So in, in, in Johannesburg, so of course he packed up the family, we flew back to Johannesburg and went to the Alitalia desk, flew out to Rome, he did this test. And uh, in those days, uh, with all the sword and sandals movies, they had a lot of muscle guys, you know, um, hanging around the sets as extras or acting. And um, so they had a gym there. Uh, one of the guys was in those days pretty well known. He was in Spartacus called Woody Strout from America. And um, my dad did this test and they said, would you like to watch it? And he said, no, I just want to go and work out. And the reason he never pursued his movie career, even though he was offered to do, uh, after he made the Hercules movies, he was offered to do the uh, spaghetti westerns. Uh, he felt them very, very boring. He, he just couldn't handle sitting around set all day long. So he made five movies and, and that was it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sorry he didn't pursue it because I think had he done so, you know, it would have taken him even to the next level. But you have to understand my dad was, if I say so myself, very humble and not a pushy guy, yeah. you know. And uh, he was just quite, he wasn't driven by materialistic things. He was happy with his lot in life and what he had. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> He wasn't ambitious at that point as a self-promoter to the point where even my late grandfather had to persuade and encourage him to go back and into university, university. Which in retrospect was a good decision. And that's why I look back in retrospect. <coughs> I think had Reg decided to go down that route and pursue the movies, he would have, you know, if I say so myself, he's, not only did he have the physique, but he certainly had the look as yeah. well to go I think you would have been a, a Hollywood icon, mm. you know, if you decided to pursue it. But that wasn't to me. So, uh, um, after we lived in Rome for a while when I was very young. And uh, after that, uh, you know, the gym business had really taken off. And um, in 65, he decided to do the same thing to promote the business and go back to the universe and enter again, which he did. Um, and he won that in 65. Yeah. And at that stage, his gyms were at the Regpop equipment and the Regpop training program and the supplements which had started and the clothing had really taken off. Yeah, yeah. In he South was, Africa. He was a good He was actually a pretty good businessman. Those I've got a, a little brochure here from um, oh yeah. and that's actually uh, oh. I'm assuming that's you at the bottom there that would be me um, I've never seen that shot and I've never seen it in color I've, I mean I've seen the shot but never in color you're gonna get Let's a copy uh, a scanned copy I'll, I'm gonna send it to you <laughs> thank you uh, that was taken uh, uh, in our swimming pool in our in our home in, 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 in Johannesburg and I would have been around uh, nine at the time I can imagine so we're it, talking about, um, about 1967 it says he three times Just, Mr. Universe so he would have definitely already had won the third one yeah Correct. Yes, so as that's what it said, 67, which was actually the same year that Arnold first came to uh, to South Africa. 
Yeah, because yeah, it's the same pool, isn't it? Where where uh, Reg yeah. and Arnold are standing there. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. yes. Brings back a lot of happy memories looking at that picture. <laughs> well. When I used to, when I had birthday parties one year, I remember when I had a birthday party and all these kids go. There was my dad, and we'd all end up swimming in the pool. Of course, it was in February, so it was you know middle of summer in South Africa. And my dad and, you know, one or two of the guys used to work for him would come and create quite a sensation <coughs> where we'd go up to them and they'd make us in their hands and they'd throw us in the swimming pool. <laughs> so it was a lot of great equipment. So it was very unlikely that, you know, their dads were able to do that. <laughs> so it became a little, a little bit of an attraction. <laughs> Sounds like fun. <laughs> So you've talked quite a lot about Reg's career. Um, well, um, I've got so many questions uh, similar to the ones I asked before. Um, and I'll just start. So we've talked about his early uh, training. Um, I want to talk about <clears throat> his training with Marvin Edda and, and the possibility that he may have, I guess, influenced Reg in developing the 5x5. Five five. Would you consider that a possibility because as many of us know Marvin Edda was one of the strongest natural bodybuilders that ever lived well he's still alive so I shouldn't talk about him in the past tense he is one of the strongest bodybuilders that that ever lived and um, he definitely because you've said that he trained with Marvin in New York and Marvin is known to have used as you said like done chin-ups and, and dips with 300 pounds strapped to him so would, would you say that he would have had a, an influence Yes, and, and you know, I don't have enough information on that. I would say, just from my thinking, yes, I, I would think it did have quite a significant influence. But I think he was perhaps aware of the 5x5 five five before that. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly know he was the first to really popularize it. Yes. You know, <coughs> excuse me. Which has become a... Uh, very popular again, the 5x5 five five methodology. And I think it certainly works well for those starting out, you know, for youngsters who are first getting to, wanting to put on muscle mass. Because there's no frills attached to it. Yeah. You're not wasting to them, which I see so often in the gym today of people who are beginners or even intermediates doing secondary movements like a lateral raise or a concentration curl where they don't even really have a structure. So it's completely wasted doing that. Unfortunately, so many people just waste time in the gym doing things that they, just because they don't have the knowledge. Yeah, they, they do refining they, motions, which is ridiculous. Yeah, they, they see them in magazines and books, but, you know, unfortunately, magazines and books don't know what you look like. Yeah. So, uh, you know, although you can get some knowledge from it, it's not the same as, you know, having somebody observe you. But, uh, so there were no frills, obviously, of the 5x5. Five five. It was all about compound movements and multi-joint movements. Uh, as you know, a lateral raise, there's no joints involved. It's just connective tissue. Correct. And certainly for, certainly for a beginner or <coughs> an ectomorph, for example, to do a movement like that, they can end up really harming themselves. Yeah. But if they were to do it, well, shoulder press, at least you've got three joints supporting the actual Correct. weight. So much safer better movement working all three hands of the deltoid as opposed to just one aspect of the natural So I think, yes, he had probably had some influence, you know, and he's obviously the time he spent in America had a huge influence on his training. He was able to really refine his physique and come back uh, in 51, being way superior to he was in 50, you know, when he came second to Reeve by one point. Um, he had the makings of a great physique to start with in 50, but you can see the mass that he put on in 51. It's, uh, <clears throat> you know, like a complete metamorphosis. And there again, from 51 to 58, there's a huge change. Yeah. Uh, you know, how, the, how much mass on the muscle mass he put on. He just kept getting bigger and bigger, didn't he? As you well know, he was the second 
man in the world to bench press 500 pounds, the first being a, a, a power lifter by the name of Doug Hepburn from Canada, who weighed around 275 pounds, wrenched to the 500 pounds two, three days later, with a body weight of 225. I believe he was guest posing, because in those days, when you guest pose, it wasn't just coming on and doing a posing routine. To a strongman act as well, which he did. Yeah. And I believe he did it in a show where he bench pressed 500 without the suits like they wear today, the competitive tight lifting suits, which gives you that recoil, that spring. And without the stands, he had a spotter on each side <laughs> from behind. And he bench pressed 500 pounds at, at one of the shows. I'm, I'm, I, think it could, I think it could have been in the States. If I'm not mistaken. So did they lift the um, weight and and he grabbed it and bench pressed it? Yes, they lifted <laughs> the weight and gave it to him and he grabbed it and did it press with it. Yeah. That's insane. So, you know, he was known for his strength, you know. Um, when, my, when Arnold first came to, the state, to South Africa in 67, he, talk, he spoke about this at my dad's memorial service, which he hosted here in the States. And it was quite comical, really. Uh, I just want to digress. <laughs> On the same day, uh, Frank and Columbo also spoke uh, at my dad's memorial and told a very humorous story. Uh, and actually, I'm attending Frank and Columbo's memorial service today. <laughs> oh, OK. Uh, yeah. Also came to South Africa. He was a real character, um, and as you know, exceptionally strong for his weight. Uh, uh, stronger than most of them. the United trainers. Arnold way stronger than Arnold. <laughs> then lifting over seven hundred pounds. You know. But um, Arnold spoke about how he thought he was strong. Of course, he wasn't used to be used to be woken up at four o'clock in the morning to go to train at five. <laughs> but Reg was one of the first to do those 5 a.m. workouts before he opened up the gym and, you know, got involved with his work for the day. He'd go and open the gym at 5, work out, and then have a, a nice breakfast afterwards. And, uh, of course, he opened up and then everyone trained, so it became very popular to train at 5 in the morning. <laughs> but Arnold spoke about how he thought he was strong, doing standing calf raises with 300 pounds, 350 pounds, until Reg was using and as you all know, Reg was renowned for his calf development. And he said to Arnold then, if you get your calves up, you will be the best one in the world. And Arnold became obsessed and he cut all his sweatpants off at the knee. So he could always look at his calves and he bumped his calves like crazy. Um, and so obviously he had a huge impact on him. Absolutely. So, you know, he was, he was renowned for his strength. Yeah. And he had even done, uh, I've seen a picture of him doing a flat bench, flat bench barbell, two barbells, barbell yes. press. Yes, I've seen find it. Find the picture. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a 150 pound barbell in each hand. Correct. And he did five reps. <laughs> now, never mind the strength factor, but just to hold an Olympic 45 Olympic bar without weight. In a hand, just think about the wrist strength. Yes. That's engagement. You know. <coughs> so you've seen that shot. I have to try yeah. and find that. If you have it, I'd like to put it on my Instagram. I will. I'll um, forward it to you. <laughs> thank you. And then he, uh, he, he, was, he, he had done, I believe he had done standing two dumbbell curls, two reps with 120 pound dumbbell in each hand. Um, so he was pretty renowned for his strength, you know, he, he always pushed poundages because he felt poundages is what developed the mass. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now, there's a... Carlos, I, I, hate, I hate to uh, end this, but I have to be somewhere in 25 minutes. No problem. Is there any way, any way we can continue this? Now, of course, we can continue this uh, if you like. Um, 
in in uh, the following weekend or whenever you're you're available. So my I'm leaving on Wednesday for the East Coast. My son Travis, who lives here with me, is um, and works with me. Yeah. We are about to meet a young tennis player who he's going to be working with for an evaluation, mm -hmm. and he's getting married next weekend in the East Coast. Right. So I'm leaving him Wednesday. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to text you some time to, to see if I have any availability. Uh, you and I both have availability before I leave. Mm -hmm. If not, then um, we'll figure out another time. I'm really sorry to cut you short. That's fine. That's fine. You've given me plenty of your time today already. So I really appreciate uh, the opportunity I'm, to speak to you. I'm, and yeah. Likewise, and I do, as you addressed before, we didn't have a time to get into it now, but I would like to address the uh, uh, the growth hormone steroid issue, you know, in our next conversation. Okay, that's that sounds great. Okay, John, John, thank you so much again. And, um, much. Thank you. Great. All the best. Have a good evening, and we'll speak soon. You bye too. Bye. bye. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the training programs of Reg Park and other champions such as Don Howarth and Chuck Sipes, please visit my website www.goldenerabookum.com where you'll find a series of out-of-print books and courses on old-school bodybuilding. So I hope you've enjoyed watching this very special presentation, the interview which I had with John John Park where he describes Reg Park's biography. I will be answering that very, very um, controversial question, did Reg Park um, ever use performance enhancing drugs and I'll be asking this in my next presentation as well as many other questions which I have for John John Park of course for example um, how how was uh, Reg Park training um, during the Hercules films what was his diet like um, did he use high volume um, and many of the other questions that I've been asked um, to, to, to ask him by you the audience and please um, let me know what you would like to learn from Reg Park and his training methods. Um, of course, this will be coming up very shortly once I get the opportunity again to speak to John John Park. Um, anyway, I, again, once, I, I, once again, I hope you've enjoyed watching this interview. Um, if you have, please give the video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't to the Golden Era Bookworm. Leave me your comments and thank you for watching. If you'd like to support this kind of work and my research, my never-ending research on the history of bodybuilding, please donate via PayPal, become a patron. Uh, you can visit my website, www.goldenerabookon.com for out-of-print books and courses on old-school bodybuilding. And of course, you can get in touch with me if you wish to um, pass on your old-school bodybuilding books and magazines. Once again, hope you've enjoyed this special presentation. This is the Golden Era Bookworm. Bye for now. And for an entertaining look at the history of bodybuilding's supplement industry, I would highly recommend watching Subs the Movie, which I have collaborated in, available at Amazon Prime and Vimeo. Hi everybody, I just want to recommend this phenomenal book, Vince's Secret Locker, volume number two by Carl Coyne. I've been looking at this for about four weeks and I can't put it down. If you get a chance, check it out. He also has a part one that I, I highly recommend also. Uh, Vince was the trainer of the stars and had an amazing, interesting gym that today there's still not equipment like, uh, like it around. It was all made out of wood. Uh, he'll be on our radio show coming up probably in the next couple weeks or so. Have a great day and again, highly recommend this book.